So welcome everybody to the second uh, joint webinar, Aging 2.0 Alps uh, chapters. Uh, as most of you know, uh, this is our second uh, webinar we're organizing after the first successful one in uh, 13th of November. Just for people that are for the first time joining uh, this webinar. So um, uh, we are an assembly of four chapters of the Aging 2.0 network of chapters. Uh, Original was the Zurich chapter, who was the major uh, initiative taker, led by uh, Patrick Hofer. The Lausanne chapter by myself, Vienna chapter, as well as Treviso chapter. And we decided actually that uh, to maximize uh, uh, ideas, uh, uh, innovation, ecosystems, benchmark, also what's going on to have our uh, Alps chapters event organized jointly. And obviously, COVID just uh, increased uh, the the tendency towards uh, towards this type of events. Just a brief uh, few words about Aging 2.0. So we are part of one of the largest networks in the world around the subject of Aging 2.0. The main purpose is that we actually uh, assemble ideas, innovations, uh, age tech companies, and make sure that uh, supply meets demand, but also ideas can actually generate uh, maximally across the different chapters and across uh, across the globe. Within this initiative, I want to just uh, take this opportunity to also mention about the collective uh, initiative that Aging 2.0 has set up, which is basically uh, taking sub themes directly uh, linked to the aging uh, opportunity or challenge and to uh, create a network of uh, insightful expert people uh, and assembling a database uh, of insights where then afterwards initiators, innovators, but also corporates can tap in towards that. So strongly recommend to also look at this initiative on the Aging 2.0 um, uh, website. Then with regard to the program uh, of today, we will uh, start today with Oscar Zanuto because uh, the last time we were the three chapters besides the Treviso chapter. Uh, so Treviso is a new chapter that joined us. So we are very happy to welcome uh, Oscar who is presenting this chapter. After that, we will have a uh, um, different startup company having 10 minute pitches about what their uh, current value offering is. And then towards 11 o'clock, we will start a panel discussion on what basically the innovation ecosystem today has already achieved, but what are there still opportunities to undertake, what can we learn from one another, and we'll have that kind of conversation to then at the end and uh, at uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, that's the program of, of today. So uh, first uh, speaker of today with us, Oscar. Welcome, Oscar, to the Alps uh, uh, chapters uh, event. So uh, the word is uh, to Oscar. Thank you very much, Alexander, Patrick, and uh, everyone for inviting us to this uh, relevant uh, meeting. Uh, so uh, I'm Oscar Zenuto uh, from uh, Italy, Treviso. Uh, so we are running a chapter here uh, in collaboration you know, with our uh, public body, which is uh, Israel. Uh, so mainly we, we work uh, as care provider, taking care of people in several scenarios, such as are nursing homes, more than 900 older people, and 1,000 living in a private home. And we are investing a lot in uh, uh, co-housing project and the conversion of building and uh, on active aging in terms of, of the use of technology for prevention, almost about dementia. And that is what we are uh, presenting today. So uh, let me share the screen and present the experience coming from uh, value uh, care project. So uh, because we are working on European project with our department is uh, Faber. So Faber uh, stands for Public Europa, which is the name of our European department. Uh, in uh, Israel. Um, we uh, have been working on uh, H2020 projects, so the Horizon project on research and innovation. And 
uh, the reason why uh, I'd like to present you value care is uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one is that we are looking for uh, new models in care and a value-based healthcare model that has been invented uh, by Michael Porter in 2006 in the US uh, are powerful ones because uh, they have demonstrated that you can focus on outcome uh, results in terms of health, but also in terms of economics, and you can uh, do more uh, with uh, sometimes less money, but mainly, let's say, with the right allocation of money. And secondly, because um, value-based healthcare models are strongly connected to the use of information coming from ICD. So the Project Value Care uh, is about the value-based methodology for integrated care support uh, of people and uh, supported also by uh, ICT solutions. Uh, this project has got 17 partners coming from all around Europe, uh, eight countries, and the leader is the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Uh, here you can see the brands. So we have people working on care, but also university, uh, two faculty of medicines, and uh, we have also uh, the advocacy uh, of older people who are in the platform that is the largest organization that represents more than one hundred, yeah, one hundred and half million of. Uh, um, older people all around Europe, and uh, Happens Medical Group, PCA Alliance, who is a broad network working on the digital transformation of care, Erasmus Plus uh, Medical Center, who is the leader, uh, it's a clinical university, then we have FBK, which is uh, the foundation and large research center based in Trento in Italy, uh, that got a, a very powerful, let's say, uh, AI protocol that we are uh, using in the project. Um, I think it's uh, the Irish, let's say, uh, agency of uh, uh, information automation for integrated care uh, is rapid. is our organization, Vodafone Innovus, uh, and we uh, we have also. Uh, in a strong collaboration in Valencia with uh, uh, the La, 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 Las Naves uh, and Cavelocio, who is uh, an organization that works on projects. Uh, we have Portugal, we have uh, Caritas Coimbra, Medwin, Croatia, Poli Benistar, uh, it's a university in Valencia, and uh, uh, the University College of Dublin uh, that take care of uh, the uh, say all the care procedures and USDUA is our um, health national system and VDAVO is I think as well. Uh, we uh, have probably seven pilots so we have the city of Rotterdam, Corken, Karen Ireland, Imbra, Portugal, Valencia, Spain, Vieca, Croatia, Athens and Treviso and uh, coming to uh, to the concept so the aim it will to to deliver an outcome-based integrated care for older people, improving their quality of life. So, mainly want to enhance the experience of older people through innovative digital solutions. Those are a virtual chatbot that I will present later on. It will improve the satisfaction uh, of uh, multidisciplinary care uh, with a stress reduction of uh, practitioners. We will use a more uh, efficient resources that we will implement and we will be uh, outcome focused. Uh, the target that we will have in Treviso in November this year uh, will be 120 older people uh, with the diagnosis of MCI, so mild cognitive impairment. This is the target uh, that we are looking for. Also, 50 up to 70 caregivers. Uh, and 30 uh, up to 40 practitioners and a small group of uh, ICT guys or so people working on uh, technology. The concept, so starting from, say, the, the citizen, 
okay, some total simulations. But we will connect pair or team with an integrated care team. Uh, mainly in our case, we are talking about psychologists and geriatricians that will set the goals in a very personalized way after a shared decision making process. This is a very key point to stress out talking about value based model. Because usually, uh, what GPs do is, is, let's say, a one way approach. So they, they got the picture of the people, of the person in the needs, they tell which bills you have to do, what you have to implement, and so on. But in the value based model, we need to discuss with the person and try to reach out a common decision based on what uh, could be doable on one side with the willpower uh, of a person to uh, do what you are presenting. Uh, so we will have several scenarios uh, about the diseases, so stroke, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart failure, and frailty focus of MCI in our case. And uh, as soon as the goal setting will be defined, um, the user uh, will use um, a, a virtual coach connected to wearable devices that uh, goes in uh, all in one app. On the right side, you will see the value care app that interconnects to the wearable uh, uh, that be also connected to environmental sensors and will deliver a specific personalized uh, care plan. Talking about the digital solutions, we have those five components. So an overall digital platform that connects uh, the application with uh, uh, the uh, uh, wearable devices and uh, chatbot in an all-in-one ecosystem. Uh, the practitioner could prepare an integrated care plan on the backend side, and they could have a dashboard to follow uh, the ongoing practice of users. Uh, the virtual coach will be based on the AI, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, engine. Okay, uh, we are also looking to gather uh, a little bit of personal health record data, but it's not in say core of the project, but uh, some parameters uh, such as blood pressure, oxygen saturation, uh, emotion tracking, and overall sleep quality tracking will be very important talking about dementia. And we will use the iChon set uh, that has been set by the Michael Porter and other teams in the US and now is uh, worldwide. So it's a very efficient way to use your um, outcome, okay? the clinical one, but also the self-reported terms of uh, uh, perception and experiences that are quite uh, relevant in the model. Uh, just a uh, zoom, let's say, a focus uh, in, uh, in the application, uh, user could find uh, vital parameters, nutrition information, set of item questionnaires uh, could have an online support with video interaction because we are trying to implement and boost the social connection of the person in the inner circle and support the motivation along the process. Uh, physical activity uh, will have also some tutorials connected to personalized goal setting. Uh, we will use also mindfulness uh, training because uh, we are just ending up another European project where we develop an application that sustains the mindfulness uh, uh, training uh, related to the self management. Uh, there are a bit of gamification in terms of words, but mainly uh, the chatbot part is the relevant. And here, uh, I want to tell you how the bot uh, will work. So we will have a personalized uh, uh, goal setting plan. And starting from the left, we will have a three weeks goal, depending on the choice of the person. 
we will define say a set of uh, brain exercise with specific reminders according to the preference of the, uh, of the users uh, and uh, each week uh, the chatbot will have a new direction like in, in WhatsApp let's say or Telegram I don't know it seems really to talk with someone but you have the AI behind uh, that give you support okay it's very funny and uh, uh, moving in the middle uh, we also detect how the parameters are going on and uh, we will boost the brain training uh, reminders but also the physical exercise the diet and nutrition part the tutorials we support the person because if someone say okay i'm interested in going uh, deep in such topic so you can simply click and you can watch the specific video or contents uh, and we have seen in literature that um, the reading uh, is it, very relevant in the brain, let's say, maintenance, and also in terms of curiosity and so on for people. And also we can send specific contextual messages. On the right side, we see uh, the area of the lifestyle that has been chosen uh, from users. and. Uh, the practitioner will have a continuous um, uh, review of the plan uh, to support the person with phone call or interaction. Um, Oscar, one yeah. more minute, please, because we need yeah. to start our next presentation slot. Yep, yeah. I'm and done. Thank you. In terms of virtual coach, it seems like this. This is, a, let's say, a mock up. Uh, you see the bot, you see the area, take your medication, brain training, and so on. And when you have a conversation, uh, you interact like this. You can have suggestions, tips, and video uh, inside the application. Uh, we want to uh, change the system, so we will have uh, also an implementation on of the core uh, concept of value care. It means to try to integrate social and health care. And uh, let's say uh, that's all about what we are doing. If you want to uh, stay tuned, here you are the um, account on Twitter, and here our uh, contact and website about what we are doing. So uh, I hope to uh, say give you to give you the flavor about what uh, we are doing, and thank you very much uh, for having us and sharing ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. Very interesting um, uh, presentation. I would like to continue with our startup pitches and introducing the presenters. Um, first speaker will be Andrea Serino. He is a professor at the University Hospital of uh, Lausanne and head of neuroscience at MindMaze. Um, they're based in Lausanne. Uh, MindMaze is one of the first Swiss unicorns and is giving us an update on Stay Fit Longer, which is an integrated platform for healthy aging at home. Andrea, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Good morning to everyone and thanks for this opportunity. I'm glad to hear about all these uh, different initiatives and to present my maze initiatives. So I will start with the general overview of what is MyMaze and what we are doing, and then I will focus on Initiative for Aging. So MyMaze has been funded in 2012 by Tesh Tadi as a spin-off of the PFL, and then it grew. And now at the moment, um, we develop our core development is for what we call digital therapeutics, that is innovative solution for to restore movement and cognitive function for brain repair, targeting major neurological diseases, we have more than 10,000 patients using MyMaze technologies in seven, more than 75 hospitals all around the world. Um, the goal, the general goal of MyMaze is building a platform for brain health. And the approach that MyMaze uses comes really from uh, neuroscience and from our neuroscience background. And our concept of the individual being in the world and interacting with the with the world, with the brain, but basically with this body, where the body is our interface to interact with the world. 
And so if we want to have technologies that can interface the brain, we need to interface with the body. We need to sense what the body is sensing. We need to capture what the body is doing. We have to analyze this flow of information and represent to the participant, to the user, to, uh, to engage him in an experience. And then in closed loops, we can reanalyze, resense, and change and adapt this experience. This general approach has been uh, transported, uh, translated to uh, brain repair and in particular to neurological conditions to acquire brain injury, which is our main focus at the moment, stroke and traumatic brain injury. And always the idea is combining cognitive and motor stimulation in uh, immersive uh, and uh, interactive devices. So the, the um, main portfolio at the moment is based on my motion family of, of tools that are a series of activity designed by uh, clinicians to target the main functions of the patients uh, with the possibility of choosing and designing. And the patient can train with our devices under the direct or remote supervision of uh, the therapist. And the idea is really to boost motivation in a gamified way in an enriched environment. So the same concept is really the basis of our, all our um, products. This is an example of how it works in the clinics, for instance. Ich habe eine Muskelkrankheit, ja genau, wie es heißt die, und ja. And uh, beside this, there, there is a, a portfolio of solution targeted the, the different deficits, as MindPod, which is a, a digital video games to interact and to develop free movement, movement and cognition. Then we also have peripherals that interface directly the body, so in case of upper limb deficits, where there are um, muscle <clears throat> muscle uh, weakness and uh, motor control movements. We have a device to provide functional electric stimulation provided by our company Intento. And then together with the Genius uh, um, Healthcare in France, we develop a series of serious game for different pathologies. One of that one is called Top Run for balancing Parkinson. All these uh, um, products have been validated by scientific studies that have been already published and are still ongoing. Uh, we are also developing more immersive virtual reality-based solution for specific conditions, targeting especially cognition. The, always the, the idea is uh, um, presenting the, the patient with a rich environment and having them interacting with the environment, recording what they are doing, and fine-tuning our, our solutions. The products, the, the current projects, uh, one is for attention, my focus, one is for executive function, it's called MindSport. So this is our know-how at the moment, healthcare for uh, brain diseases. But of course, as we are here, we know that aging is one of the major challenges that we have with great overlap of, of our healthcare solutions because most of our patients are aged individuals. But the transition from normal aging to pathological aging is somehow blurry. So we want also to see whether we can help uh, no healthy people, neurological healthy people along their aging. And with, with this aim, we developed this project, uh, which is called State Feed Longer. That is a project funded by Active and Assisted Living Program from the EU, which is a consortium of uh, clinical experts led by the Centre Lénard de la Mémoire at Chouve uh, and the uh, University of Montreal, with two world, worldwide experts, uh, Jean-Francois de Monet and Sylvie Belleville, leading from a scientific point of view. And then from a technical point of view, we have HSSO, the Valais Valley. We have the ARC that are helping us in developing the platform. And then we have clinical partners and family and associations of caregivers like Prosenctute and Brusano. And my is uh, the, the industrial partner and, and commercial partner for this product. So the idea of Stay Long is that we know what we have to do to have uh, healthy aging, or what I uh, call well aging. We need that we need a combination of cognitive activity, but we need a combination of healthy living, nutrition and active and move. Uh, and these are recipes that we all know. The, there is evidence from the scientific literature that if you combine, you can provide cognitive training to slow down cognitive decline. It's even better if you combine with physical activity and with a healthy lifestyle. So starting from the core of, of science behind it, uh, we know on the other hand, there are, there, sorry, there are a lot of uh, uh, tools of apps for cognitive stimulation that have been developed. They are in the market, they are easy to, to download and use. But this, these tools have not been developed for aged people. They are developing more for young. They are fun and you can use, but then in terms of generalization of the improvement to everyday life, there is not too much evidence. 
So I worry, and then the other problem is how you keep people motivated to use that. So based on what we know and what is in the market, we developed this new concept that is called the State Feel Longer. It's an app that contains a combination of cognitive training and physical training. I will tell you a bit more about that. Uh, and combine it, motor and cognitive training, but then there's some other features that are important for us. First of all, is gamification to keep people motivated and engaging with positive rewards. There is a piece that what we call metacognition, that is increasing awareness from the elderly about their uh, um, cognitive function, how it works. There is a concept of self-management. These things work only if people really engage and use themselves in a good way. But then, of course, you need a, a tutor. So we have a virtual tutor, a guide that helps the uh, users to, to, to use the, and to do their exercises. And then importantly, there is a social component. That is, the, all the users are connected via chats and social network, internal and protected through the system, where they can exchange um, their experience, but they can also change their tasks. That is, there is a game that they can build with their information and they can share with the others. So this is an example of, of the physical activity. These have been designed by physiotherapists from uh, um, HOS, uh, what they call specialization, um, with movies of nice uh, training. And there is a, an elderly person who has to do some activity, mainly for balance and for preventing falls. There, is, there are a series, and this was developed through a prize from the Fondazione Enarte. Then there are the, we develop a series of games, and in particular one for divided attention and task switching that has been developed under the scientific leadership of Sid Bibelville, who is one world leader on, on these topics. And this is a dual task, so uh, participants are uh, playing in this virtual city, and they have to pay attention to people and to things happening on the floor, and they have to respond with their pushing the bottom, but also with their feet, with some um, sensors from gate up. And having developed these tools, we are now running a randomized clinical trial with 128 seniors involved in three countries, Switzerland, Canada, and Belgium. And uh, the design is having a really <coughs> a randomized clinical trial with two groups, one experimental group who receives longer for six months, and then a control group who first receive a control training that is uh, same stimulation, but not titrated and not uh, um, specific, and then pass to stay longer to give also the possibility of the control group uh, subject to, to, to benefit of stay longer. We will collect clinical outcome measures to see how the evolution of, of the um, function of the users will be. But more importantly, I would say at this stage, we also collect adherence measures to be sure that uh, participants will, will uh, um, adhere and will. Andrea, one more minute, please. And then we are together with Curapi, that is uh, um, developed by Genius Care, another company in the MyMaze portfolio. They develop a solution for inpatients that is now used in, uh, in uh, nursing homes, long stay homes for elderly people. There is a paper study uh, published by the group of Philippe Robert in Nice. And uh, they use this uh, new game that's called XTORP that is based on a big screen, a motion capture system. And the game combines physical challenges with cognitive challenges. There is an environment of navigation between Icelands. And if Icelands have a cognitive challenges that elderly people can do. And in this paper, they show that motivation and engagement of people in, of senior people in uh, nursing homes increases after these trials. So with this, I, I conclude by uh, just summarizing that really the core of my maze is developing digital therapies that are validated for brain restore and brain health. Aging is a key and challenging area. Uh, we are still new in this area. We are entering this, this area, but we really believe that our approach combining cognitive and motor exercises in a gamified and connected platform can be value for elderly people for, to support healthy aging. And with this, I thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Andrea. Um, next up is uh, Sven Beichler. Uh, Sven is the founder and CEO of uh, Tom Medications based in Zurich. Sven is talking about the leading Swiss health app for medication management. Over to you, Sven. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. All right. So thank you very much for um, having me. Um, I'm Sven Beichler, I'm the founder of Tom Medications. 
Well, um, our, we are an interdisciplinary team of people suffering under chronic diseases by ourselves. Um, so we decided to um, fight this non-adherence to therapies for chronic diseases uh, from our own experiences uh, two years ago. Um, two years ago, we started with um, a prototype first um, with the goal to have a solution which can be used by almost every kind of age between uh, my 10 year old son and my 82 year old mother. And uh, to do so, we developed a prototype and tested it for uh, 10 months with uh, 100 uh, patients in 2019. And after this, uh, we, we gained uh, enough uh, feedback and experience to develop the final solution, which was deployed last July in 2020. So our main goal is really to fight non-adherence to therapies for chronic diseases. And I don't go too much uh, in, in the issue itself. I'm very sure you're, you are very much aware of this issue. Not only me, but um, uh, many people, 2.2 million people in Switzerland by itself are um, uh, affected by chronic diseases of all kinds. And this and the issue here is not is that there is not one reason for non-adherence. There are hundreds and thousands um, uh, reasons for non-adherence. So um, to understand better what how we can help and how we can rise uh, increase uh, adherence to therapy for chronic diseases, we have to understand better the situation of individual patients. And to do so, we have two axes. One is the time. Um, we have to understand and to help on a daily basis today, but also to understand the history. Um, and uh, there is a, just a very simple example. When I have a, a doctor meetings every six months, the doctor always asks me, how was the last six months? And I said, mm, as far as I remember, quite good. Or uh, did you uh, suffering um, for, for side effects or whatever? And I can't remember really very good. So we have to understand and to monitor what happened in the, in, in the past. And the third part is also to um, get the benefit out of this analysis from today and the past to predict the future uh, course of um, uh, adherence to therapy to enable earlier interventions and therapies for the doctor or the caregivers. Um, our stage today is we developed, as I said, the Tom app last year. Um, we have uh, uh, a lot of um, users gained. We had a great traction after our prototype phase. And um, the Tom app is basically something which, um, as I said, is to track and analyze your therapy in a holistic um, view. So not only um, a pill reminder, of course, it's like pill reminder, having a pill reminder is like having wheels on the car, it's just necessary. But uh, it's much, much more as you can imagine, it's really to uh, the main part is the ease of use. It's not just designed for power user, it's designed for everyone, um, but also our main um, patient peer group is between 60 and 80. So uh, they must be able to use that on a very easy way. It's totally anonymous because uh, if I want to help me or to help somebody to uh, stay in the therapy, it's not just not necessary to know what the name is. And um, it's uh, to tracking and analyze your um, your activate your activities, your mood, your side effects, your pain level, and uh, give a, a meaningless um, reminding and reporting system. Um, today, Tom is used by 20,000 patients each month in five countries, and um, we have 70,000 patients in total. And every day. Uh, we have between four and 5,000 daily active users um, using um, actively uh, the Tom app. And um, first insights from, from uh, the usage over the last seven months, we have, we're hitting almost a 2 million planned medication intakes through the therapies of the patients. And we have um, a confirmed confirmation of medication intakes by uh, one and a half million 
which is um, a great increase compared to um, very simple level, but still an increase we can see in the um, adherence of therapies compared to the Swiss market at least. And that's not just the beginning. So the next step for us is going into Tom Care um, using the Tom app, as I said at the beginning, from the tr tracking and monitoring and understanding from the situation today and in the past to analyze the data and to provide a digital health platform um, to understand the health status and data progress of the patient. Um, to do so, we develop um, a dashboard which provides for caregivers, um, especially a situation where you know better your patients, because you're just not able to know everything, of course, to interact with your patients directly through our uh, Tom app. And uh, at the end of the time to save uh, time to uh, focus more to the patient's uh, therapy itself, of course. And um, to make the bridge from the Tom app today to the Tom care solution, um, today the patient is using the Tom app by themselves. And for Tom Care, the Tom app will be used by the caregivers for the patients. Um, this is uh, how it looks or, and, and how it will look, your activity planning in the Tom app for your patients, um, your direct interactions with your patients. And uh, to, it doesn't matter if it's uh, you're planning your lunchtime, your, your uh, cleaning or your medication intakes or to uh, go have a discussion you know, just a social um, uh, touch point. It doesn't matter. You are on, uh, uh, you have uh, at a glance an overview of all your patients on, on one side. And um, at the very end, I'm, I think I'm the only one who f faster than 10 minutes maybe, but uh, uh, I think um, we are on a very good way with the Tom app to uh, reach the next goal, uh, 100,000 uh, active users in the Tom app to understand every day much better what the needs are. And um, to give you a f um, an idea how we develop the Tom app uh, nowadays, we develop only on user feedbacks and we get tons of user feedbacks in uh, any kind of language around the globe. Um, it's the, the main countries we are focusing right now is Switzerland, Germany, Spain uh, and France. Um, so we're developing on each feedback we get from the patient itself nowadays, and it's a tons of feedback. And the major issue here is, I cannot stress it enough, is really to make complex therapies accessible for all the people in a very, very easy way. And as you may know, I mean, um, to make something complex easy is the most difficult thing um, at all. So this is the issue and the goal from Tom to make something complex like adherence to therapies and, and uh, very complex therapies, I have to say, very easy to use. And that's something as, as it uh, looks like today we, uh, we achieved. We have a very high retention rate. So uh, users are staying and sticking in the app. It's, uh, we have uh, the same level and increasing organically every day. Uh, we hardly um, lose users to say so. So, um, and that's the, uh, just the start of our journey. And uh, I have to say, we would be happy to find a pilot customer for Tom Care. Um, then we want to do the same thing as we started. We started with real users uh, to build this and not with our only our focus. And we want to do the same thing for uh, caregivers um, uh, again. So thank you very much. And that's it from Tom. Thank you very much, Sven. Very interesting presentation as well. Um, our next guest is Ulrika Axius. She's the managing director of ADRAC uh, in Zurich. And she will be talking about the immune system in our aging population with regards to COVID. Ulrika, your turn. Ulrika, you are on mute. Yeah, yeah, so I found it, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So yes, let me introduce myself. I, uh, I work for ADRAC, or we call ourselves ADRAC. 
uh, ADRAC stands for Adverse Drug Reaction, and I thought that was quite interesting as a bridge to what Sven was talking about. Of course, many uh, what we are very what we focus on is the uh, when there is an adverse reaction, or very often what we call uh, drug hypersensitivity or drug allergy to a drug. Uh, and I believe that that is also one of the reasons why many therapies are not adhered to. Uh, so I would, I think we should maybe also talk later on, Sven, and see if we can maybe see some, 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 uh, some, some benefits there between us. Uh, because it is, uh, so what we are doing, we are, I, I don't know if we want to call ourselves a startup. <laughs> we started, uh, I believe it was like a little bit longer than 10 years ago. It was a spin-off at that point. Of course, it was definitely a startup. It was a spin-off from Insta Spital. It was uh, Professor Pichler, uh, uh, Werner Pichler, who uh, immunologist, a well-known immunologist in the field of drug hypersensitivity. He decided that he wanted to work way longer than 65. Uh, he and he realized already when he was about 60 that if he wanted to do that, it, the university was not the place to stay at. So he wanted to move into more the commercial world. Uh, and he was very, he realized also that there was a need for the drug hypersensitivity testing. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so he decided then to go out and start his own company when he was, I believe, 60, which I think is, is very daring and, uh, and, uh, and he was then very successful. He's still with us in the company. Uh, he works uh, very actively. He still publishes a lot. I uh, uh, asked him also when I was going to have this presentation. So you know, now it's the focus of aging. Uh, so he helped me also with the uh, to give his input for for this. So we, as I said, we started out being the drug hypersensitivity, and we are that is what we have been doing for the last 10, 15 years. Is the drug hypersensitivity. Uh, we are uh, working in the cellular immunology, immunology field, and we are very lucky to have, we're very small, but we have very high level scientists uh, in our team. And one of the scientists that we have is uh, Dr. Yeli, Dr. Daniel Yeli. He has experience from the uh, virus field. So now I'm going to bring up the topic that most of us, it was quite interesting to hear the presentations now because we haven't really talked about at all about COVID for uh, almost half an hour or one hour, which is amazing because it's these days, everything is about COVID and everybody talks about COVID, of course. And we realized early on uh, in the pros, in, in the, the whole, um, when the whole pandemic started uh, already in March, that we had the new know-how to do, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to contribute in this field. So we started early on to develop our own assays, uh, tests for COVID testing, but not the traditional one. I'm sure you have all heard about uh, antibody testing uh, and um, of course antigen PCR is something that everybody's talking about, but the most common one to test for immunity is the antibody testing. And that is because that is the one that is the easiest, the, the most easy way to, the easy one to test. Uh, but not everyone does have antibody tests. And that is something that we see when we're doing the cell, the, the drug hypersensitivity test, we, we are moving into the T cell area. And we have then now also developed a test for the COVID within the T cell area. Uh, and it's a very, very uh, complex test. It's, uh, it's not cheap. Luckily, Switzerland is one of the countries where these tests are reimbursed. I believe it is also because people in, in our health uh, supporters in, in our government, they realize the need for these type of tests or diagnosis, how much that, that can help, um, help patients and in the end then reduce the cost, the total cost. Uh, so what we then, this test that we have developed, the T cell test is really thought for those cases and i'm sure you have heard it in your in your uh, uh, in your friends group in your in your your your, your relative your in your office you've heard people that are saying well i had covid uh, but i don't have any antibodies and do am i immune or not and it's the same topic uh, with the vaccine will how long will the immunity last what type of immunity will we have uh, and that, of course, is what we are focusing on, because even if you do not have antibody uh, bodies uh, that you can show that you have antibodies, there is a very high likelihood that you still have T cell immunity, 
We cannot say right now how long this T cell immunity will, will last. We don't know, but we do believe with our experience uh, that, that there is uh, immunity, even if you do not have antibodies. Uh, so this is what we, then you have the case of, uh, so I would like to maybe change quickly the slide. Let me see. Uh, share this. I have not been, I'm talking a lot here, so I'm not, so here we go. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So here, <clears throat> moving over to the aging. So I wanted to put a picture of uh, Professor Pichla. As I said, he's still working intensely with us. Uh, and this is his statement uh, when I told him what we were talking about. And he says that aging and old age is not per se a problem uh, with, the, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the immune system. But of course, there are a couple of topics that uh, there are some things for the aging population. There are some that works in favor uh, of being uh, in the aging group, or there are some things that works against. And the things that work in favor uh, is that basically we have uh, a lot of experience and uh, as being uh, in the older generation. Uh, and then of course, not only as uh, in our experience with uh, uh, in our mind but also our experience in our immune system the immune system has has had the opportunity to experience a lot of different viruses in the past and that means that an older person who is healthy who's generally healthy actually to some extent has an advantage uh, against a virus a new virus like the coronavirus but of course, many older people are also treated by uh, immune suppressants. And when you have immune suppressants, that on the other hand, it works as a disadvantage. The typical one being the cortisone. Uh, so, and these are the cases that would then be interesting to come uh, to do the analysis that we are doing. If you have a case, somebody who is on cortisone, who uh, for example, has had the disease, has shown that they, they've had the disease or shown that they have had the, the vaccination, but they are not creating high antibodies as expected. We can then test if they have T cells. And with that, it would be possible to see, to, with the high likelihood, tell, tell the patient that with a high likelihood, you are protected. Um, what is also interesting, I didn't know this. This is something that, again, uh, Professor Pichler explained uh, when, uh, that's why I fa it's fascinating to give these kind of speeches because I myself don't come from the, from the scientific area. And uh, so I need to learn, I learn every day and working with these people is so, so interesting and I learn so much. And what I learned now on this topic was that apparently we all have had this uh, herpes virus. I think almost everyone in the population has one time been exposed to herpes. So our body, uh, and there are different viruses, you know, with herpes, you have the tissue one with the cold sores, but you also have the, the Gürtelrose, I don't know what that's called in, uh, in, uh, in uh, English, sorry, that's one of those words, I don't know. Uh, you have the Epstein var var uh, bi virus and so on. And these, apparently our bodies are currently fighting these, uh, these virus. And when you get older, because your, your immune system uh, gets a little bit, um, you have less of the T cells and the T cells are the one that are fighting, uh, fighting your, your herpes virus. Uh, so the system is, your, our system is busy treat, treating the herpes virus. And that means when new viruses are coming in, there may be uh, a small weakness and we are not, the, the, the body is not able to fight the virus uh, to the same extent. So that I found very, very fascinating. Um, we, uh, we have just started this test. <clears throat> it's, um, we're offering it in Switzerland. As I said, in Switzerland, uh, it's reimbursed. We, it's difficult to offer it in other countries. A test that uh, I believe should, should be offered in, in every country in the world, but it is very time consuming, it's very complex. And because of that, of course, it is very expensive. But we are trying. One we minute, are, please. Sorry. Yeah, one minute. Sorry. <laughs> we're trying our owners. Uh, we have investors who uh, are working in South America. So we're trying to see if we can, 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 uh, can spread the, the, the test there. We're working uh, maybe with Austria, maybe with Sweden. So we have some opportunities. And yeah, it's a very, very interesting world to be part of. I'm very grateful to be part of this world. And uh, I hope that we will be able to show very soon uh, that even though we do not have uh, antibodies, 
our T cell system, our immune system is still able to fight this disease that we are all so much aware of these days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulrika. Um, very interesting as well. Um, next coming up uh, is Alessia Moltani. She's the CEO of ConfTech, um, also a very innovative company from uh, Milano. ConfTech is introducing garments that are equipped with sensors that are integrated into the fabric. Uh, those sensors allow to monitor and collect biometric data, such as the heart rate and other vital parameters of the wearer. Super fascinating. Um, and I would say, finally, an alternative to the devices that I would definitely displace. <laughs> um, welcome, Alicia. Thank you very much. Just the time to share my screen. Hope it's fine. Is it going? Yes, I think so. OK, so thank you for inviting me. It's very interesting. Uh, to be here and to discuss uh, with you ideas and solutions. Uh, and moreover, it was opportunity to explain, uh, to share a conflict approach uh, to smart aging. Um, Comtech stands for Comfortable Technology. And uh, as introduced by Daniela, <laughs> we uh, produce uh, wearable monitoring systems based on smart textile. Our first experience was in Nikon, neonatal intensive care units. But now we have solution for uh, many, many <laughs> ages. And of course, uh, elderly is one and maybe is the most interesting one. Um, as widely discussed by previous speakers, uh, we all know that the world population is aging uh, with a huge impact, uh, economic and social impact. In Comptec, we believe that uh, as long as we can help seniors uh, to stay active, active uh, as I discussed previously, physically and mentally active, they're going to be a resource both thanks uh, to their large experience and their ability to connect with the younger generation. So it's going to be a virtuous cycle. <laughs> Uh, but how can we ensure that we avoid at least delay the uh, physical and mental decline? Well, of course, we believe that prevention is the key, but we also believe that uh, continuous monitoring is one of the key to prevention. Uh, continuous monitoring able to give objective data, so objective feedback at the three levels. The first level, of course, is an individual elderly person, especially when autonomous, independent. The second level is, of course, the caregiver, and the third one is the doctor. So with this goal in mind, we have designed how the senior. Audi senior is a monitoring system that supports the elderly, both autonomous and not, doing daily activities. Why daily activities? Because it's very, very comfortable, absolutely non-invasive, and it's easy to use and to care. So we have designed the whole system with this idea in mind, to be able to offer a continuous monitoring during daily activities. So, we have a technology that can offer the opportunity to the elderly people, but I would say to everyone to live in an independent way and with no absolutely impact of the monitoring system on daily activities. Moreover, how the senior, it's an underwear, basically can be a top, a vest, a t-shirt, but it's underwear, so it's completely invisible. <laughs> No one knows that you're wearing it. So what are the, let's say, what, what is the structure of the system? Basically, we have three pieces in the system. The first one is the smart garment. As I was saying, the smart garment can be a vest, a t-shirt, a top, with different shapes, depending if we're speaking about a man or a woman, of course. 
and uh, can be with uh, different composition of the textile. So just think about a normal textile. But uh, the difference is that we embed in this textile our textile sensors and textile circuits that are made with conductive yarns. They are high quality, really, uh, they can offer reliable uh, data. Uh, we tested uh, them so many times, uh, also in uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with newborns in the hospitals, and uh, they are comfortable, soft, and flexible, and washable. The second component is the electronic unit, the electronic unit that we attach to the garment. Uh, to be honest, uh, we could embed the electronic inside the garment too, but uh, then uh, there is uh, a, a, an economic point. Uh, I mean, uh, you use a lot of t-shirts and less electronics, so that's why <laughs> we attach it, so you can detach and wash the t-shirt as many times you need and you want. So the electronic unit is really small and uh, is able uh, to uh, record but also, of course, to transmit in real time a lot of uh, physiological parameters. And uh, uh, the third component, but not less important, is the software, of course. But I need to say that uh, um, in many times we connect with uh, software of partners. So it depends. Sometimes uh, we offer the good solution. Sometimes uh, we connect with other partners that can add other uh, features you know, to uh, the data that we basically offer. As I was saying, the system is completely non-invasive and it's washable and it can be customized <laughs> as all <laughs> the textile can be. Coming to the uh, parameters, uh, uh, through the garment, of course, uh, we uh, can detect the heart rate, but I, I say real-time EKG, uh, the activity level, of course, and the respiration rate. Uh, the product is a medical-grade product in a class 2B. And the company, of course, is 13485 certified. Uh, we also are working on new algorithms. Um, they are still work in progress, something that uh, we think we will finalize by the end of the year. Uh, so we are running some clinical trials on sleep quality and the snoring detection, of course, and the stress detection and gait analysis. Regarding the interfaces, we basically have two kinds of interfaces. One is for doctor and the other is a user interface because uh, we think that it's so important to involve the user. Uh, and the doctor in, uh, can have, of course, uh, all the data, the graph, and also we can uh, offer to the doctor a uh, full report of all the uh, monitoring sessions as you can see here in the upper part of the screen. Regarding the uh, benefits, of course, we have uh, both benefits for uh, the, the user and consequently benefits for the caregiver and the whole healthcare system. It's possible with uh, our senior and our garments uh, uh, help uh, the elderly person to stay active in safety. So run, uh, I think it's uh, rehabilitation exercises uh, and so on. But uh, I think the most important thing is that uh, as uh, Audi Senior offers objective data, uh, we are not speaking about uh, subjective feelings about tiredness. Uh, it's something that uh, is uh, connected to objective data so that uh, the single person can evaluate uh, thanks to the feedback of the system how far he, she can go with his exercises. 
and also is uh, supportive uh, in all the rehabilitation activities uh, uh, and offers to the doctor and therapist uh, the opportunity to understand and to assess uh, how the elderly is moving uh, and uh, to assess this not only during uh, the few minutes uh, of the therapy session, but uh, in his, her, everyday life. And I think that this is also really, really important. Alessia, one minute, please. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Moreover, uh, it offers a precise cardiorespiratory uh, movement trends. And this also is important to evaluate uh, how effective uh, treatment and medications are. And uh, why not to mention uh, the simple fact that uh, with this kind of system, uh, we can have a large, amount, a large amount of data that can be uh, a good basis uh, uh, for a future and increasingly accurate personalized medicine. Um, what else I can say? Well, well something that uh, is uh, strictly connected uh, to the actual situation, of course, uh, thanks uh, to wearable monitoring systems, also during televisit, telemonitoring, uh, we can have a lot of objective data again. And uh, so we can uh, reduce the time uh, spent uh, in uh, hospital uh, and uh, people, uh, in general, and uh, moreover, uh, elderly people can be uh, safe at home. And um, I would have a lot of things to, <laughs> to, te to tell you, but uh, the time is running out. So I really thank you for this opportunity. And if you want to test, to try the system, you can get in touch with uh, George and Patrick and with Basse. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alessia. And so finally, I would like to present Christian Kusnic, an Austrian neuroscientist, who is the CEO of Mindset Technologies based in Vienna. Now, Mindset Technologies is a fascinating Austrian startup that gathers data on attention and eye movement in the largest database on human attention to be, and will detect anomalies and utilize these early signals for early warnings. He is currently very active in the esports area with his technology, but when it comes to aging, he's working on the world's largest dementia AI initiative. So I'm asking myself, who needs Elon Musk when we can have Christian Kuzmich? Over to hello, you, Christian. Thanks for, Daniela, hi, <laughs> hello to all, and thanks for the invitation. And uh, yes, uh, that sounds like a mouthful, the, the largest database, but. Uh, uh, especially since we are very much at the start with what we're doing here, but you will see uh, after the presentation uh, what, what that really means and uh, how our approach is, which is pretty different. Uh, I will uh, try to share my screen now. Yes, here we are. You should be able to see it already. Yes, uh, what we do is, and I'm also very glad that, uh, for instance, uh, platforms uh, are here also on this call uh, because we also want to make a platform, but in a different, uh, on a different stage, so to say. Uh, so what's interesting for us is uh, to predict attention. So what we do is we predict attention, we predict human attention. And uh, when I say we, I will also later show the team behind it. Uh, Daniela has already uh, presented me as neuroscientist. This is de definitely the, my academic career. Uh, in my post-academic career for a while, I, I spent uh, a lot of time in, in strategy consulting, starting with different uh, global and uh, also local uh, consultancies. And uh, my last station, and that is very, is very decisive and, and, and very important to say here, uh, I was working for a weather company uh, for Red Bull, for the Red Bull Empire. They have a weather company. And you can imagine when you, I don't know, uh, jump down somewhere from the stratosphere, you need a good weather prediction. And the thing is, uh, I, was, I was leading the innovation there. That means I worked a lot with modern developers and I, I worked a lot with uh, mathematicians and uh, physicists. 
And uh, we started to develop AI at this point that was able to predict some signals. Uh, it works pretty well with technical signals, but then of course, uh, I come from a sphere uh, where the signals are not that easy, first of all, to detect, and second, not to predict, uh, because biological signals are per se uh, at least ambiguous. And uh, when we talk about eyes, I'll just give you one example. When we detect the value that sa says we have uh, uh, no light coming from the eyes, no pupils, for instance, uh, you have at least three options what's going on. Uh, it could be a blink, you could be dead, or you could be sleeping. Uh, normally, it's the blink, but you have to find that out with the, with the right logic. So what we are doing is uh, we uh, predict attention in any circumstance that's possible and necessary and useful in the very beginning. Plus, we also are a startup that needs to have money. Uh, that means we start with uh, businesses that are also lucrative for us in the long run. Uh, and, and also in the long run, and uh, coming from my interest, it will be a lot of medical applications, and I'm going to show why that is. Um, neurodegenerative diseases, and you know that pretty well, they are mostly characterized by progressive decline of, of motor functions, psychic functions, cognitive functions, and uh, many times a selective loss of neurons within the central nervous system is the reason for this. And uh, the, the point is, uh, when we look into the eyes, when we look at all the signals we can get, the eyes, of course, are pretty intriguing because they have a social component, but they also uh, show a lot of what's going on within a person. And this is not just in, go in, in playing poker. Uh, it's uh, showing the fatigue. It's showing a social recognition. It's showing a cognitive, uh, cognitive processes to some extent. And uh, I personally come from brain research. So I was looking at slow potentials of the brain at the University of Vienna um, years ago. And uh, in this case, the, the eyes were mostly uh, a pain because uh, they are huge potentials and they're always in the way if you want to find out something uh, that makes sense in the brain. But what we do here is want to make something that is not in the laboratory. That's very important. We want to have something ambient here, something like a pulse watch for the brain, something as easy to use as a pulse watch for the heart. And uh, the reason why that this is important, um, we are looking at early suspicion, so to say. We cannot say we have something like an early, uh, um, early, I don't know, diagnosis. That's that's not the point here because the diagnosis works pretty well when when it's clinical. Uh, but what we do is we look in our uh, studies, we are looking for studies, we are looking for um, a proof of concept in the medical area, and we will see later how we, how we do this. Uh, we are pretty much interested in dementias, we're interested in Parkinson's disease. And this is because uh, we have a lot of markers there already that show an early onset, that show prodromals, that means uh, symptoms uh, or uh, behavior that goes before a clinical detection of the disease, uh, sometimes years, sometimes decades. And uh, the thing is currently, uh, everybody's desperately searching for this biological markers, uh, also statistical markers, like saying, what is the risk for this? What is the risk when you're smoking? What is the risk when you have an excessive consumption of alcohol? Maybe at some point, uh, what is the risk of uh, having had a COVID infection? Uh, later, since we know that this virus is not uh, really kind to the nervous system as well. So um, we, we work in those two domains. Uh, we are looking for partnerships in those two domains, but we look primarily at behavioral markers and physiological markers when it comes to risk. And uh, I will show uh, in the next slide a couple of markers, but the thing is, the eyes, since they are so sensitive and since they, uh, the, the, the motor uh, action is pretty delicate and, and pretty easy to disturb. Uh, they are also a good uh, look into uh, what's going to be at some point into the neurodegenerative processes. Uh, the value that we're looking is the quality of life and the reduced burden of disease now from the macroeconomic perspective, definitely, because if we, are, if we know uh, where it itches before it does, that means if we detect something that's pretty early, uh, all the processes can be cheaper in the end. So we are not looking actually, we're looking at aging, but we're not necessarily looking at persons of age. Uh, so this is, this is very important, yeah. Uh, what's also important is that uh, when we look at the, uh, those risk factors like biological markers, 
uh, biological markers per se are not easy to get. And even if you, um, maybe you need an iPhone and a, a drop of blood, and then you can do something like a biological analysis. Uh, you can do a, a gene analytics or whatever you can do. But the point is, it's uh, to some extent, it's uh, intrusive and it's uh, definitely not a buy-in. Uh, you have to do this and you have to decide upon this. Um, what happens now, and this was one of the ideas I had when we started uh, with, our, uh, with our startup uh, two years ago, searching for investors, searching for projects, uh, where COVID is actually not very helpful, I must say. Um, we, we thought of tracking the brain like we can track the heart. So the, the thing is, if we could only track the brain like we can track the heart, uh, we could have something like better indicators of... Uh, malignous um, processes. The thing is we can, but it's not easy. And it has to be non-invasively. And uh, since I come from psychophysiology, I of course look, like to look at psychophysiological measures and we look at the brain monitoring component and a mainstreaming of non-invasive brain tracking. So it's not like Elon Musk. So uh, I like the comparison because we're not sticking electrodes into the brain uh, that enables people to download information because we are so lazy and don't want to learn the natural way. Uh, it's, it's, something, it's something that goes into the early detection uh, and that helps to improve uh, the outcome. Uh, what is the basis, uh, the uh, scientific basis behind this? We know pretty well that uh, some eye movements that can be recorded in the laboratory are a pretty good indicator of diseases. They also are discriminator. Uh, sometimes because with this wide concept of attention, uh, we have a construct like inhibition. And we know that in some diseases, inhibition uh, is, is pretty hard to do, uh, like, in, like in Alzheimer's disease. So what we can see here, for instance, is uh, uh, in an anticipate uh, Paradigm, a paradigm with what is called uh, that we have an impaired saccade, we have an impaired reaction. So we are, if, if uh, people with Alzheimer's disease in the very beginning are forced to suppress uh, irrelevant stimuli, they have problems to do this. So if we do this in the clinical setting, it's easy. If we have to put this into the field, this is then our problem. Uh, we have to be, uh, uh, yeah, we have to work differently. And, and so it goes with a lot of neurogenerative diseases. Uh, Parkinson is also very interesting because uh, due to uh, changes in the dopamine levels, of course, the, uh, the eye movements change as well. And uh, this is a collection that we can look at. And this is now the point. The question is, what can we measure in the field? In the laboratory, uh, we have an apparatus uh, costing sometimes 8,000 euro, 9,000 euro. So that's, that's pretty nice, sometimes 70,000 euro, by the way. So it's pretty expensive to measure eye movements uh, correctly. Uh, we want to measure it uh, ambiently. That means, for instance, I'm sitting here in front of a camera and uh, this camera is only used for showing uh, my picture to you, but not for analyzing how I blink or analyzing how attentive you are to what I say. And, and this is what we're looking at actually. And, uh, we detect signals, so we have one component that is machine vision, and this machine vision is or should be, uh, currently it is not, uh, it is not absolutely uh, agnostic to what we has an, uh, have as an input currently, but it will be, and uh, we work with those kind of devices. Uh, we want to build this buff cam here for the gamers uh, with an onboard uh, AI chip that recognizes the person and recognizes the patterns and provides a feedback on the state of attention. Uh, we work with this eye tracking tool here from a partner company in Austria. And we want to work, since we have the same technology in the, in the iPhone cam, like in our cam, uh, we want to work with just normal cameras uh, to detect signals. And the thing is, why is it the, the biggest initiative? Um, well, my idea is, the problem with biological signals is always the baseline. You have no baseline. Uh, for a person, it's always hard to, to say what is the baseline and what is the change, uh, what makes an anom anomaly. And so what we can do is we can take data of as many people in different circumstances, uh, starting with uh, a high performance aspect like in esports and sports and also e-learning where we know that the attention must be high in order to achieve something. 
and then also go to settings where the measurement is in buy-end, like for instance, people watching TV uh, doing cognitive gaming, uh, and then see uh, how the, or cognitive gaming would rather be here probably, uh, uh, see how the reaction is and see if we can detect anomalies uh, with our AI analytics in behind. Christian, uh, one minute, please. Yes, okay. Uh, the basis for this is a patent uh, we have. I have uh, is I have got a couple of years ago uh, for detecting attention and fatigue. And uh, when we have all those uh, sectors here covered, of course, we have a huge database of, of different people and, and different reactions to the outcome. And uh, what's important to us, and this is the last slide here, is it's, it's knowing where to scratch. And why is this important? Because a long time uh, it's asymptomatic. And, and if you don't have any symptoms here, uh, like this saccade, you never notice it, of course. Uh, if we can measure this, we need to have a, a really a subtle but decisive process where we say there might be a risk. And if there is a risk, how we should uh, uh, feed that back to the, to the probably patient, that is a hard thing to do. So this is something that is another challenge here besides all the machine vision and then buy-in and the apps. But the... Uh, the point is speed safes definitely. So the earlier we are when we detect an anomaly, uh, the earlier the clinical investigation can start and something that is just a signal, probably a signal, uh, will change uh, to a symptom. And then you can start with the therapy earlier. Uh, Hemi Parkinson. Parkinson is a classic for this. So if you just have uh, on one hemisphere, it helps uh, if you're early not to have it spread to the other hemisphere as well. Uh, this is our team here. Uh, we have a member of the advisory board, a neurologist who is also uh, specializing in uh, gerontology. And uh, we have a team that is also very keen on uh, machine vision here, like Dr. Schroeder or AI and behavior. And we have uh, a CTO who comes from the medical sector for the, for the big architecture behind. Uh, me and uh, Alada Tepelea are looking for long-term investment, but we're also looking for R&D partnerships. That is very important, especially in the health sector. So that is our main goal here. And yeah, thank you so much, thank Christian. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Andrea, Sven, Ale uh, Ulrika, Alessia, and Christian for amazing presentations. Uh, and now I would like to hand over to Patrick.